Please join me in welcoming Lawrence Williams. Thank you so much, Rachel, and thank you, Alexandra, for inviting me and organizing this event. Uh, I spent the afternoon uh, with the Chemical Entanglements Working Group, and it was really fascinating, and I would encourage you to show up tomorrow because uh, it would be worthwhile to see what they have to say. Um, so, uh, yes, I wrote a book about breasts, <laughs> and my husband said, I'm really comfortable with this, but I'd like your next book to be about a body part from the neck up, if that's okay. <laughs> Um, and, and so why write a whole book about breasts? Well, a lot of my topics really do start from sort of a personal story. Uh, in my case, I hadn't really been that interested in breasts before I started breastfeeding. I had two children, and I have to say I was totally knocked out by the experience of breastfeeding. Um, for me, it just kind of um, was revelatory in how it cemented my legacy as a mammal, you know, which is not something that I think we access often, sort of in a conscious way. Um, and I started to learn more about how these mammary glands make milk, how they work. Uh, but at the same time, I was also very aware of this other legacy I have in my own family, which is breast cancer. And there's much of it there. So, um, in terms of what I learned about the mammary gland, you know, I, I assumed that it evolved 250 million years ago in proto-mammals for nutrition, because that is primarily how we think of it. That is how formula companies recreate it. Uh, it's food. But actually, breast milk evolved as immune support. That was its primary purpose. And in fact, many of those immune functions have stayed intact through these 250 million years, years. And, and those are not you know, antibodies and immune factors that are really able to be replicated as of this time in formula. So I was astounded by this. Uh, you know, the way milk works, it, the way the mammary gland works, the machine, is it, it basically converts blood into milk. So how miraculous is that? You know, it, it's very cool. And, and what it does is it's able to take these molecules and put them and convert them into milk. But unfortunately, as the mammary gland evolved, it did not learn the mechanism for filtering out molecules that should not be in milk, of now, of which we have many <laughs> now in our world. And so I became very interested in flame retardants, as Rachel said, PBDEs, polybrominated diphenyl ethers. Um, and I found out that these flame retardants, these, these molecules are a number of different uh, classes of chemicals in the flame retardant family, they were doubling in breast milk every five years. And the Swedes were the first to figure this out um, because they are uniquely devoted to breastfeeding, I would say. Um, but, but it turns out that, that this was also happening in the United States, although there hadn't been very many women tested. I really wanted to tell the story. Um, and it occurred to me that I actually had breast milk because I was still breastfeeding my daughter at the time. And so I decided for the New York Times Magazine, I sent a vial of my own breast milk to a lab in Germany to get it tested. And uh, what I found out was that my levels, in fact, were 10 times higher than the levels that they were finding in Sweden. And I'm sorry to tell you Californians, the Californians had levels even 10 times higher than my levels. Uh, and that's because the history of flame retardants, PBDEs, um, really, uh, it, as, as, as they are used and were required to be used in upholstered furniture and other household products like electronics, was because the bromine industry successfully lobbied California to create a standard requiring that these chemicals be put in these products. And so the rest of the country followed suit because if you're selling furniture in California, you might as well sell it everywhere else, um, although Californians still retain the highest amounts. And it turns out that these brominated flame retardants, um, they were designed to delay ignition in a household fire by 12 seconds, <laughs> which was not, in fact, enough to really save lives. And the molecules themselves, the flame retardants, when they got on fire, created this really toxic black smoke filled with dioxin, which we know causes cancer. Um, 
And what does save lives in fires are things like smoke alarms and not <laughs> smoking. And in fact, those two things have happened, right? And so now people are not dying so much in the house fires. Uh, and it's not because of plane return. Um, so I'm happy to say that actually California has now um, rescinded that standard. It's phasing it out. Uh, I'll talk more about what's happened to the levels. Uh, I also ended up finding out, as Rachel mentioned, jet fuel ingredients in my breast milk, uh, and also trace amounts of the pesticide DDT, uh, which was developed for use in World War II. Uh, and after World War II, manufacturers said, wow, we'd really like to sell this stuff mm -hmm. to civilians. Uh, and so they started doing that. And in fact, uh, 1.3 trillion pounds of DDT were used and sprayed in the United States um, by 1970. They were not tested for health effects, uh, as most chemicals were not. We have 82,000 industrial chemicals in the United States in use. Um, less than 1% of them have ever been tested for health effects. And interestingly, uh, a woman who worked at the EPA, now works at the National Institutes of Environmental Health Sciences, told me that when chemicals are tested for health effects, the mammary glands are thrown out. The mammary glands are not tested, typically. And this is despite the fact that the mammary gland is the site on the body that is most likely to get tumors. So talk about a blind spot for women's health. DDT was so popular that uh, it was actually sprayed on wallpaper oh. in children's rooms. And it was Rachel Carson who really alerted the public to the potential hazards of DDT. She herself was alerted by her suburban friends, women who were at home and who were noticing birds literally dropping out of the sky. And they said, Rachel, you've got to do something about this. Rachel was a science journalist. Uh, and so Rachel Carson was able to find out that, in fact, there was a body of evidence looking at the health effects of DDT, but no one was paying attention to, to the research. The research was done independently. Uh, there was research suggesting that, that bird eggs were thinning. Um, of course, we know insects were not doing well. That was the idea. Um, and uh, unfortunately, uh, Rachel Carson did not live long enough to learn that DDT would eventually be implicated in breast cancer in humans. Uh, and, and what that research shows is that if you were exposed to that fog that had been coming out of that truck before the age of seven as a girl, you had a five-fold increased risk of breast cancer. Uh, and that research is pretty, pretty recent. Um, but Rachel Carson herself died of breast cancer two years after Silent Spring was published in 1962. And of course, because of her and because of the public outcry, um, the EPA was, was uh, founded, and we are now slowly starting to research more chemicals. So this is a picture from Life magazine uh, in the 19, 1954 on Jones Beach, uh, and it is a fog of TDT. And of course, I like it because it has breasts in it. And um, you know, really, what, what all this brought home for me about breasts I mean, they're a charismatic organ, right? I mean, it's more fun to write about breasts than to write about, you know, the elbow or something. <laughs> but it turns out that breasts really are this kind of unique organ in terms of how, what they tell us about the environment around us, because they are so sensitive to environmental change. Um, they have so many hormone receptors. They are actually evolved and built to converse with the world around us. So unfortunately now they are conversing with things like DDT. I realized that I had to start at the beginning to really learn why there were blind spots when it came to understanding breast health. As I mentioned, the mammary glands were thrown out. People were reluctant to really study breasts, to look inside them instead of just looking at them. And I realized I had to start at the beginning. Why did they evolve? What did they evolve for? Um, it turns out that humans actually are very unique in having breasts. 
Other animals have ma other mammals have mammary glands, uh, but in primate other primates those those mammary glands get enlarged only during lactation, and then they recede. Whereas we develop them in puberty, women, and then we have them forever. Uh, and so it raises the question why. So this is Desmond Morris. <laughs> um, I visited him at his home in Oxford just last year, actually. And he's a, he's a famous geologist. He, in 1968, he wrote the book The Naked Ape, which is about humans. We are the naked ape. And in it, he posited this very sort of foundational theory about breast evolution, in which he said, um, look, you know, breasts really look like the buttocks. If you kind of squeeze them up which of course they were not squeezed up for most of evolution. There were no push-up bras. Nevertheless, he thought they looked like buttocks and, um, and that therefore they were a sexual signal because that's what the buttocks often are in primates. Um, and we are frontal, front-facing uh, creatures and so we had to have a sexual signal on the front. And so that's what breasts are. And, and moreover, because we had these fabulous sexual signals, we were able to attract mates and keep them monogamous and provisioning us who were waiting at home in the cave for our mates to bring back the mastodon. <laughs> so it's an interesting theory, um, <laughs> but it has a lot of holes. And one of the holes is that we actually have no idea when breasts evolved. When you dig up bones of Lucy, you know, there's no fossil evidence for breasts. And so there's no way to prove that breasts actually evolved in sync with bipedalism, for example. Um, there are a number of other holes. Um, why are they so fatty? And why do we need them so early? But I love this picture because it's um, Artipithecus. Um, and notice that she is drawn with a pair of breasts, even though there is zero evidence for the pair of breasts. And what this says to me is that actually people who draw <laughs> people who draw primates like to draw them with breasts. So here's Bigfoot. You know, oh we God. are living in an obsessive breast culture. So um, this is Bigfoot. You know, the, the fake film about Bigfoot. She also had breasts. And it was sort of silly because there was no infant in sight, right? So she would not really have had breasts. <laughs> so the alternate theories, uh, this, you know, after, after Desmond Morris published this book, uh, you know, in the 1960s. In the 1970s and 80s, women started coming up in the fields of anthropology. And some of them started challenging some of these long-held assertions about breast evolution as sexual signals. And they started saying, well, and some of them, by the way, were breastfeeding. And they noticed that actually it was kind of handy to have a movable feast of a nipple that could slosh around and be right there where infant, he, human infant has to be held. It's one of the only mammals that can't actually ever hold up its neck, right? So it has to be held in the crook of the arm. If the nipple can swing around, it's all very handy. Um, and moreover, the human infant has a much higher fat requirement than any other primate infant. And the human female has a higher fat requirement. In fact, she can't even reach a threshold for puberty without a certain level of fat. And she can't reach a threshold for gestation, much less lactation. So where is she going to store this fat? So some of these anthropologists have said, look, you know, the breast is filled with estrogen receptors. It needs to be. And where there's estrogen, there's fat. And it could be that these breasts that we're so obsessed over and gaga over and sexualized are actually just happy accidents of fat deposition. But of course, men do like to look at breasts. <laughs> But not all men like to look at breasts, and this has been shown in survey after survey, and not all men prefer large breasts. In surveys, there are men who prefer small breasts or who prefer medium breasts, or there are guys who are just like men. <laughs> However, um, we are so steeped you know, in this mythology of the big breast. It hasn't always been this way. So uh, in the 1920s in Hollywood, in the silent film era, small breasts were in. Uh, and it was really only after World War II that large breasts became such a big deal in Hollywood. And the theory there is that, like many other things in the 50s that were sort of genderized, women were kind of domesticated. They were placed into more domestic roles, 
men didn't want to compete with women for their factory jobs. They wanted these jobs back. They wanted women sexualized. They wanted them domestic. And they wanted them at home. And so the big breasts became really fetishized in Hollywood. I've actually heard another theory, too, which is that in the silent film era, you could show the nipple, the outline of the nipple, and that that was enough to sexualize the breast. But then there were these Hollywood codes that came in. You're an ally, so maybe you know, someone knows about this. But the Hollywood codes came in and said, uh-uh, no more nipple. And so Hollywood compensated <laughs> by just making the whole organ bigger. But of course, this had tremendous implications for mainstream America. Um, blow up bras, <laughs> the torpedo bras of the 50s. Uh, everyone wanted bigger breasts. And of course, this, um, this very much um, helped uh, aggrandize the plastic surgery industry. First, there were silicone injections, and then by 1962, silicone implants were invented. Um, in a, this, this one's a parody, but in a lot of these before and after pictures, the idea was that if you had small breasts, you must have very low self-esteem. And if you had big breasts, you know, the world was your oyster. And in order to really drive this point home, the plastic, surgeon, surgeon, plastic surgery industry invented a disease for small-breastedness and called it micromastia and actually pathologized small breasts. Uh, and uh, I have to say that um, now, unfortunately, kids growing up have so much access to fake breasts on the internet. This is, this is an Android app. Boys and girls both grow up expecting breasts to look a certain way. And that is generally large and gravity defying. Yes. <laughs> So breast implants today are actually the most popular cosmetic surgery. <laughs> Not the most popular cosmetic procedure, but the most popular surgery. 300,000 women a year get them. Although interestingly, 100,000 women a year get breast reductions. And what that tells me is that women have an awful lot of issues around body image. And not very many of us are satisfied with our breast size. Um, but interestingly, also, um, 30,000 men get breast reductions. And this brings up the point that modern life really is changing breasts beyond just putting silicone in them. Um, breasts are getting larger, natural breasts are getting larger in both men and women. Um, this is probably due to obesity. Men's and women's bodies are getting bigger overall. But also, breasts are arriving earlier in girls. Half of American girls are developing breasts by the age of eight now, starting to get breast budding. Um, and this, this is about menstruation, not breast specifically, but you know, in general, it's expected that the age of puberty would drop as we become healthier, as medicines become better, as nutrition becomes better. We're supposed to be able to sort of reproduce when conditions are good. But what's happening with this dramatic drop in the age of puberty is that we're seeing really a mismatch between the signals that girls' bodies are sending, how they're looking, and what their brains are saying in terms of how mature they are and how mature the boys are who are around them. Uh, this is the difference in the onset of breast development just since 1997. So um, the blue line is uh, where we were in 1997. The red line is where we are now as of 2000, the study was based, published in 2013. Um, the age has dropped about a year in terms of breast development. And the green line is girls who are at the highest stages of obesity. So there is a factor in obesity. And we also see puberty playing out in terms of race. So African American girls are, are developing breasts uh, up to a year earlier than Caucasian girls right now. Why should we care about when breasts show up? Well, early sexual development puts girls at risk for depression, substance abuse, and sexual abuse. Uh, and the age of puberty is actually a major risk factor for breast cancer later on. And not only breast cancer, but also other reproductive cancers, ovarian cancer and endometrial cancer, uh, and probably hyperinsulinemia as well. 
The reasons for this are still indeterminate. Uh, obesity uh, is a big factor, possibly. Um, however, uh, if, if you look, I mean, if you look at obesity, the percentage of teens who are obese now has really doubled from in the last 25 years. Um, but there was a really interesting study in Denmark where um, they were looking at stages of breast development in girls, and it actually replicated a study from 15 years earlier. And what the research found was that girls were developing breasts 11 months earlier in just that 15-year period. And yet their BMI, their body fat, had not changed. So something else was going on. Uh, we know that chemicals and substances in our environment do cause changes in breast tissue. Contraception, hormone replacement therapy, um, substances like red wine, uh, these make breasts denser. Density is also a risk factor for breast cancer. And uh, BPA, the so-called canned food chemical or water bottle chemical, uh, has also been shown to change the way mammary glands develop uh, in lab animals, as well as turning on and off genes that regulate things like tumor suppressor genes. So I was really interested in finding out more about this. I had tested my breast milk, and at this point my daughter was about six, and we decided that we would also test our bodies for some of the kind of um, chemical actors that were being looked at by federal researchers uh, in terms of early puberty and what might be driving early puberty. And so we looked at BPA. Um, we, this is a little bit complicated, but we did basically a before and after study working with the Silent Spring Institute. So first we tested our urine, which is where BPA is, um, where it's found, um, uh, kind of uh, as part of our normal diets. And then we did a three-day detox where we did not eat canned food, we did not drink canned soda, we actually tried to avoid any food that had touched plastic, which is extremely difficult to do, unless you have a cow in your backyard that you're milking yourself. But I would go to the farmer's market with sort of my you know, canvas bag, and I would just reach in and grab the lettuce and never put it in a plastic. I mean, it's really hard to do. <laughs> but I was able to drop my levels a lot. So the pink line is my before level, the blue line is my after level. But my daughter was really not able to budge her numbers very highly for that. Um, you know, BPA is actually found in 95% of the urine of Americans tested. Uh, it, we do metabolize it very quickly, but we're exposed to it in sort of a constant drip. So it's always there. Uh, this is triclosan, uh, another endocrine disrupting compound. Uh, it has actually, I'm happy to say, recently, um, the, the uh, FDA has recently requested that it be removed from personal care products. Uh, it's been shown to alter thyroid and reproductive hormone levels. Uh, and it's commonly found in, uh, you know, like uh, hand wash kinds of things and also toothpaste. Again, my levels were really high initially. Uh, they dropped like 99% after detox. So with triclosan, there are some chemicals that you know personal action really is able to make a difference on. Um, but these are phthalates. And phthalates are used in plastics. Um, they soften plastics. They also are fragrance stabilizers. They're found in things like vinyl shower curtains. Um, my levels were crazy high, like much higher than the, I mean way higher than the American average. And I had no idea why. You know, there, the problem with buying personal care products today is that they're not labeled. We don't really know what's in them. We don't know where our exposures come from. And so we only have so much power to actually kind of filter our own personal environment. So breasts are also sensitive to other environmental agents. We know that they're, they're sensitive to, um, for example, nuclear radiation and to radiation. Girls who got a lot of x-rays as teens are more likely to get breast cancer later on. So that kind of you know, raises this interesting point about windows of vulnerability. During the life cycle of girls, there are times when our breasts are just more vulnerable. Um, you know, one of the conundrums is why, you know, why does breast cancer risk increase in girls who go through puberty earlier? Is it because they just have a longer period of exposure to estrogen? 
um, or is there something about the way the mammary gland develops um, that you know those cells after puberty, those cells are sort of undifferentiated. The, one of the cool things about the mammary gland is it doesn't actually fully grow up. It doesn't fully mature until the last trimester of pregnancy, which means that if you get your period early and you don't get pregnant until your mid-30s like I did, your breasts are sort of hanging out in this state of sort of potential vulnerability through undifferentiated cells. So breasts are an ecological organ. The fat in them attracts pollutants. Like I mentioned before, they have lots of hormone receptors which are constantly conversing with these chemicals and these hormone mimics in the world around us. They're the last organ in our body to develop. So lots of undifferentiated cells, and they're constantly changing. They're constantly building and degrading this mammary gland with every monthly cycle. Breast cancer is the top cancer killer globally. It's not in the United States. For women, it's lung cancer. But global rates are expected to rise 20% by 2020. And there are differences among groups. African American women have a higher rate than white women until the age of 40. Uh, and cancers found in that population are also um, more fatal. And they're often caught, caught later. And there's less access to care. These are trends in breast cancer. We know that since 1960, breast cancer rates have doubled. And that happens to coincide with when many industrial chemicals came into widespread use. Uh, now, a lot of people say, well, that also coincides with mammography. Maybe this is just a detection effect. Mm -hmm. But the fastest, growing group of can the fastest growing cancers are found in women under 40. That's where the rates are highest. And those are women who don't get mammograms. So, you know, we've looked at breast cancer as a genetic disease, uh, but clearly there's more going on. Uh, and instead of just thinking about the genome, we also need to think about what people are calling the exposome. The challenge is, I think, how to tell these stories. <laughs> but I would submit that it presents a new opportunity for environmental storytelling about the body and because our cells are a frontier in this new era. And they match the frontiers that we're seeing in terms of scientific inquiry <coughs> about environmental health. We're actually seeing a kind of a new literary trend that I'm very interested in. Michael Pollan calls it super fun gothic. I call it um, toxic memoirs. <laughs> I think these are really compelling stories and compelling ways to tell them. Um, this first one uh, is um, written by a woman living near a super fun site in New Jersey. And let's see, okay, here it is. Um, instead of just looking at you know the legacy our parents leave us in terms of their psych the psychological damage they do us, we now have to look at the, the actual cellular legacy that they've also left us. What did they have? while they were pregnant, when we were in their womb, and what are they passing down to us, into our cell lines? Um, here she says, um, I wondered how much else of her was in me, not that what she said to me and what I said to her stuff, but what comes through the blood and the cells. Um, this second memoir is about a girl who grew up in the shadow of Rocky Flats, where plutonium uh, triggers were made for bombs. Uh, and this other one is from um, PCB, the woman who grew up near the Great Lakes where there's a lot of PCB contamination and she ended up, uh, she and her sister both ended up with really severe ovarian cancer. I think that it's interesting that these books are written by women and I'm interested in why that is. I think that women are used to narratives of exploitation and trespass. And I don't think it's a big jump to sort of move from what's a visible and sort of violent trespass to an invisible one. Uh, and I also think women are used to sort of railing against the establishment that doesn't tend to hear these narratives. It's important to remember how powerful these narratives can be. And what's happening now that I think is also fascinating is that women and communities are able to even gather data on their own, which is very subversive. 
So there's a new movement now in citizen science. This is a microethalometer. It measures air pollution, black carbon, and particulate matter. I wore one recently around Washington, D.C., where I found pretty high rates of black carbon. Um, people are setting these up in China. Um, I know researchers at George Washington University who are setting up air monitoring stations uh, around industrial sites in Brazil. So these are ways that actually challenge regimes, uh, and they can be very subversive and very powerful. Uh, it's not a totally new idea. So this is Dr. Louise Reese. She collected hundreds of thousands of baby teeth in the 1950s and 60s, uh, and she was looking for strontium-90, uh, which uh, you know is a byproduct of nuclear testing. She found that levels were 50 times higher in the baby teeth of kids born after 1950, when nuclear testing really took off. And because of this work, which was so powerful, it really led to the partial nuclear test ban treaty. So I think there is often very direct, uh, direct results from when citizens and when mothers and when families get politicized. Um, this is what happened when Sweden banned DDT in the 1960s. We banned it about 10 years later, unfortunately. Um, but you can see the levels really declined. They didn't decline totally because DDT, like the flame retardants, stick around. They stay in fat for years and years. They're also still in soil. They're still in water. These are not substances that easily break down. And they also travel very long distances. So actually, they're found in mammals in the Arctic. Um, they're found in people in the Arctic, and high levels actually because of the precipitate in the Ar Arctic. Um, so now we're coming back to the PBDEs, to the flame retardants. Um, it's starting in 2003, which is actually when my daughter was born, California started phasing out the flame retardants. Uh, and you can see that levels have dropped. These are the sort of four of the major congeners found in four major mixtures of these PBDEs. Um, they dropped 39%. Uh, but that is actually not that great, because 39% of their levels are still higher than the levels in Sweden in the 1990s. But the trends are going in the right direction. This is a painting by Thomas Aikens. It's a very famous painting of um, the surgical theater. They're performing breast, uh, actually a mastectomy, breast removal of a woman with breast cancer. The picture right now, I see it and I, it reminds me of Trump signing legislation in his Oval Office. It's a lot of white men, <laughs> yeah. uh, and they're affecting women's health. Um, this really illustrates that we used to think of the breast as a disembodied organ. We thought that if we could cut it off and it had cancer, that we could cure cancer. We did not appreciate the fact that the breast is really connected to the rest of the body, and it's really connected to the rest of the world around us. People who got these mastectomies often were not cured. The breast cancer had already spread. We need to understand that breasts are connected, that they're an ecological organ. They connect us to the world around us, and they offer us an invitation to take better care of our world, but also to take better care of our health. They're extra vulnerable, but they're also really symbols of what's happening to the rest of our bodies and what's happening to our brains. If we know how to listen to our bodies and not just look at them, then we can really start to make change. Thank you.